Good afternoon. Welcome and thanks for joining us for today's HIS Talk webinar, Completing Your EMR with a Medical Image Sharing Strategy. It's brought to you by Life Image. I'm Lori from HIS Talk and I'll be moderating. I have a couple of housekeeping items to make you aware of before we start the webinar. Attendee phone lines have been muted to prevent background noise. Please use GoToWebinar's questions box in the console to submit your questions to our presenters at any time. The presenters will answer your question during Q&A at the end. You may also use the chat function to send me a message or ask a question. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you'll receive a link to the recording as well as one to a PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation and a white paper. We have two speakers today. First, we'll hear from Don Dennison. Don has worked in the medical imaging informatics industry for over 14 years and he's currently serving as a consultant, panelist, and speaker. Joining Don will be James Forrester. Jim is the Director of Imaging Informatics at the University of Rochester Medical Center in New York. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Don. Thanks, Lori. As, uh, as Lori mentioned, uh, my name is Don Dennison, and uh, I've been in the imaging informatics industry for some time. Um, I, I serve on the board of directors of the Society of Imaging Information in Medicine, as well as on the uh, American College of Radiology Connect Committee. And it's my pleasure to also welcome in today's talk uh, Jim Forrester, who's a very experienced imaging informaticist. Um, and he's going to talk a lot about some of his real world experience uh, on the topic of image sharing and share some of the uh, results that he's been getting on some of the statistics related to that financials. So I think it would be great. So getting into our topic, uh, today we're talking about completing your EMR with the medical image sharing strategy. So what are we going to try and cover in the time that we have? Uh, first, we'll talk about why image sharing is such an important part of a complete strategy. Uh, what are some of the methods, the more popular methods for sharing those images? And then what can you do in terms of preparing your existing system, uh, your data such as patient records and images, and the people that uh, at your organization for that image sharing program. In addition, when you're sharing these images or receiving these shared images, we're going to talk a bit about incorporating or integrating those shared images into your imaging and medical record systems. So it's not only about PACs these days, but also PACs and EMR. And throughout it, I'm going to make some references to some useful IHE profiles. IHE, of course, being the Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, uh, which provides guidance on some uh, technical APIs and transactions and integration methods to help us um, have more reliable and cost-effective integrations and consistency of data. For all the people attending today, um, there will be a white paper which has been prepared along the same lines as this talk. And it goes into good detail. I recommend uh, downloading it. Um, in there, you'll see a lot of the content we're going to discuss today. Plus, it'll have references to a lot of additional reading and some additional content that we just don't have time to cover. So I do recommend downloading and reading that paper. Um, in addition, there was a paper published, a shorter paper, more of a primer, really, at the end of last year around RSNA time. And that paper essentially talks a bit about the clinical and business drivers, where what we're talking about today is how to actually put a image sharing strategy uh, into place, into production. So I recommend both for reading. <clears throat> so let's talk a bit about the importance of image sharing. In today's environment, <clears throat> a number of hospitals all forming themselves into either a accountable, formal accountable care type organization or simply through referral patterns. Uh, you know, strong or loose affiliations. Um, and within those organizations, uh, there's often either multiple PAC systems consolidating or multiple PACs storing to a VNA, and that therefore images can be stored and retrieved from all the participating organizations. But from a patient perspective, they go to where the service provider that they trust, that they recommend to them, that's convenient near their work or their home. So invariably, as we know, those images can be managed within systems within a provider network, such as yours, and you also have part of their patient record in an external provider. And if we are going to talk about a longitudinal patient imaging record, we have to consider all of those as part of the patient. So regardless of how you organize yourself internally um, and how much uh, you 
in the systems in your consolidated enterprise across your various care facilities, you are almost always going to have a set of care provider network partners that you have to receive information from and to. So really, image sharing fills that gap where an internal VNA, uh, a vendor neutral archive, or an internal PAX can't be used uh, with uh, facilities that are outside of that enterprise. So I'm going to talk about uh, three main ways uh, to share uh, imaging, and then I'll talk about a bit about some alternatives. But the main concepts that are kind of evolving is one is the the old reliable, which is portable media, which essentially is the digital version of of replacing of printing film and shipping it around, um, whether it be on CD, DVD, or some other type of um, hand carried drive. It needs to be physically transported from the facility that exported it to the one that received it. We also have an emergence of private uh, health information exchanges, some of which will include image exchange within their scope. Some of them are only clinical data. But the concept of this is some form of trusted broker that sits among these participants. And there's, there's an agreement among those participants to form a consortium to say, we are all going to agree to use a common method and common policies, identifiers, and we're going to share information. And lastly, we have cloud-based image sharing service. And this is a, a a commercial offering that uh, participants can choose to participate in that uh, normally uh, provides content and services based in the cloud. In other words, they're used remotely. And you make connections or you log into that system. Uh, and you use it as basically your image transport uh, to get data from one point to the next. So I'm not going to talk a lot about portable media. Uh, there's not much uh, positive to be said about it. Uh, there are two things I do want to highlight. In addition to all of the challenges we run into about damaged media or it being lost and, and format interoperability, um, one is you know, media getting lost. There's a lot of uh, protected health information in the header of these images. And these media that are basically being produced and, and handed out to people and then could potentially be lost are essentially a, a, an important uh, potential risk. Encrypting that data is technically feasible, but it adds a lot of operational challenges for the receiving side. And the last one is a uh, point on here is you will often see if you go into these organizations that are receiving a lot of these disks, especially ones that are very difficult to import or to view, if they, if they try their kind of the common most methods to import that and those, those methods fail, they often decide not to import that. And essentially, they discourage the, the sharing of that data, and they do uh, a retake of that exam. Uh, and a lot of that, that type of activity doesn't get tracked so, or, or measured in any way. So those, those, are, um, those are some other things about portable media people don't always track. So if you are going to do portable media, uh, the Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, or IHE, has provided us a couple of good integration profiles to at least help us do it a little bit better job of it. And that is by defining a way to make the way that that media is written, that CD or DVD is written, and the way the content is organized on it to be more consistent from vendor to vendor. They have provided that. They've also provided us guidance in when we receive these external images, either through portable media or other methods, what are some reliable ways to ensure that we reconcile those images so that they link with our patient IDs or MRNs and all of our different coding systems. I'm going to talk uh, a fair bit about information reconciliation later on. But the key is that there have been attempts to try and make this a little less painful, although it doesn't eliminate all of the risks I identified. The next method I'm going to talk about is a private HIE. Now, these take on many forms. But the key takeaways are um, a, a common method that is identified through the use of something that IHE has, has uh, come up with, and that's referred to short form as XDSI, which stands for Cross Enterprise Document Sharing for Imaging. And it essentially defines a set of uh, system capabilities that allow a system to publish that it has content available for sharing, a set of systems that can store the, the reference to those that content, such as a CT study, a set of capabilities to index it across or across the multiple facilities that are that are publishing this, as well as a method for a consumer to discover and ultimately access that data. 
as part of this profile or part of this approach, they, they additionally define the recommended or best practice method for cross-indexing uh, patient identities. So as each hospital has a different set of MRNs for a patient, within this profile and its related profile, referred to as PICS, it gives a framework to how to go about bringing this information together using uh, an open uh, framework defined by IHE. One of the main parts of this is the, the healthcare information exchange operator. And I'm going to talk a bit about this, but that who that person is, whether that is a IT team at an academic center, an independent group, a government agent, uh, agency, uh, it's very important who that is as to how successful the participants of that consortium, uh, how successfully they trust and how successfully they engage with us. I'll talk a bit about that. So in the private HIE, I, uh, IHE has provided us a number of um, well-documented and proven integration profiles. So there's the cross-enterprise for document sharing. That one is for sharing files or documents of any format. So it could be medical summaries. It could be uh, any form of uh, physical file that could be uh, or digital file that could be shared. The cross-enterprise sharing for imaging, which is the, the variant or the, the pro content profile variant of the first row, which is essentially adapted with the unique attributes of medical DICOM imaging and documents. And as I mentioned, there's the patient identifier cross-referencing. This particular one really deals with how do we take records from one MRN domain and exchange it and make it available and link to another MRN domain. And then lastly, there's a, uh, another profile which is a, a little less known, but I think is quite important, and that is the Multiple Image Manager Archive, or MIMA, which essentially provides guidance on how to, as you're moving data from one imaging system to the other, what values should be persisted in which DICOM attributes as they pass from system to system so that it's much easier to identify which domain or which identity domain uh, or accession number domain that that content came from. So these are all uh, available for private HAE operators to provide best guidance and integration. In image sharing using a cloud mechanism, this is essentially, you'll see the diagram looks a little similar, but because these organizations are all basically sharing a central clearinghouse. But in this case, you may have organization A and B wishing to share and C and D wishing to share, but they're not sharing amongst each other, across them. So the cloud-based image sharing provider essentially plays a role where they're uh, um, uh, operating a multi-tenant service, allowing each organization they're going to share and how they want to control access or sharing of that data among their business associates. But they, they benefit from a shared infrastructure in the cloud that can scale out and they don't have to worry about all the IT parts. They really just focus on their business rules and their affiliate programs um, and use it like a service, much like all of us use a lot of online cloud uh, services today. Uh, again, here, IHE provides some guidance. I've already talked about uh, import reconciliation and MIMA in the private one, so I won't repeat them. Uh, but one comment I will make is that even if, uh, when you're looking at IHE profiles, they will, they will typically define a very explicit set of transactions in order. And if you find yourself in an environment saying, well, I don't exactly follow those transactions, but I want to get some value from understanding this, often reviewing those IHE profiles to see what values they're recommending data to be put into. So for example, if they're saying, take these patient identities, this set of patient identities, and put them in the DICOM attribute other patient ID sequence so that they're kept and persisted, you can still glean some value by going through those profiles and learning about them. So two quick comments on some alternate approaches, which I'm not going to go into great detail, but uh, are still used. One is the, the, the classic DICOM transfer. So you have an organization, I have an organization, we string a VPN or some kind of LAN, we configure each other's systems, AE titles in each system, and we just start sending data across. This solves the transport problem, CD problem, but it, what it doesn't do is it doesn't resolve if you have a different patient identity scheme for a patient than I do. In other words, the patient has two different numbers. By passing this back and forth, not only does that not link them together, depending on the system's capabilities, you can actually end up with what's called a patient ID collision. So if you've called uh, Jane Doe 
patient123, and I have Alex Smith, and you send it over to me, and uh, I'm using patient123, they can actually get linked together, and that can be a patient safety issue. So this can only be used in those safety concerns have been addressed, and uh, the problems that I described don't exist. Another method uh, that people will use is they will use some form of sandbox. Now, whether that sandbox is at a neutral location, hosted at organization B, hosted at organization A, uh, that doesn't really matter. What, what does matter is, and the benefit of this, is that people can send information into the sandbox, and then other organizations, when told, hey, that stuff's available, they can pull that down. Now, the sandbox may or may not have some ability to reconcile, uh, but at least it allows the consuming organization to have some level of picking and choosing what gets shared and what doesn't. Uh, we're in the example above. Uh, if the sending organization send, decides to send every study they have, it will end up over there. So having discussed each of those uh, different types of approaches, the media, private HIE, and the cloud-based image sharing, what I have found is that where people say, well, what's the best approach? What I say, well, it really depends on your scenario. So I've I've come up with a table here, and I'm going to talk about each row here a little bit in detail. So you may find some of these scenarios familiar to you and, and are what the environment you're in, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the decision processes. So in a physician's office, uh, obviously these, uh, where they have a, a small amount of imaging, that's not their primary function, and that's low IT resources, they don't have a large IT staff, um, you know, op participating in a private HIE and integrating their whatever practice management system into that uh, becomes can be rather onerous or difficult for them. Portable media is attractive because it's very easy if they do have images to, to send them off and if they get them maybe they just view them but don't actually store them so for them it's not as painful, they're not reconciling it. Uh, but where cloud-based image sharing can be quite attractive is that because these type of services allow an individual rather than an organization to sign up, I can sign up as a a physician, a GP physician, and I can um, uh, get images shared with me from other health systems, view them in that cloud platform, and not have to worry about downloading them and integrating them into a local system. Uh, but CDs are, are hard to kill because they're, they're just quite easy for people to pass them around with the patient. An imaging center where you have a high volume of images, um, and, and I say low IT resources, but it really depends if it's a, if it's a larger chain of imaging centers they can, in fact, have quite sophisticated IT resources. But let's assume that this is a smaller standalone one where they don't have a lot of full-time staff or data center type infrastructure. So these will, uh, you know, doing portable meetings are painful because there's so much of it. Private HIEs make, make some sense if they're sending a lot of that content up to an affiliated network uh, where it's, you know, quite common where they're sending it to. But if they're sending their imaging to multiple different organizations or receiving priors from all the different organizations if they're doing reads at the imaging center. That can be very complicated and, and painful. So the cloud-based image sharing is, is useful there because it allows them to broker that up. Um, the one thing is, is that if the imaging center is going to have any type of cross-indexing or automated cross-indexing, it will need to typically have some form of patient identity information or ADT system to be fed in to do this cross-indexing. Otherwise, um, it, the reconciliation or updating of the data will have to be done um, manually or semi-automated. In the case of a standalone academic hospital, this is an example uh, where it would be a large hospital, say in a state, it's kind of the premier hospital in the state. Now, affiliated with them, you have a lot of regional medical centers or community hospitals, but they're not uh, owned. In other words, they're not part of the same legal entity, but there's a lot of lot of kind of sharing up to that. So as these community centers in the rural areas find cardiac or cancer or ortho type patients, as soon as the patient has a, has a serious enough condition, they want to refer them up to that academic center. Um, this is quite common. So what you'll find here is that where that referral patterns are very strong. Like there's a lot of things happening. If you imagine viewing it like ants, they'd all be walking to the same hill then a private HIE, and in many cases, the academic center can act as that HIE uh, operator, providing a, a, a broker set of services that allows all these external organizations to share their information, have that all automatically cross-indexed, and then inject it into their local PACs or VNA or both. And the similar thing is about the cloud-based image sharing, where you have a lot of these affiliate organizations sending up to the academic center, and they want to be able to view 
additional imaging that was done by that academic center back down, this will act as that, as that broker. The next scenario uh, that I evaluated was unintegrated health system. And this, what I mean by this is essentially a bunch of facilities that are owned by the same uh, legal entity, strong affiliates, but they have yet to, for example, put a shared BNA in. Maybe they don't all share the same BNA or the same patient identities, or they don't have a, a cross index or an EMPI to do that. Maybe they haven't finished out rolling out their common EMR across them. So they're essentially legally entity or owned together, but they're operationally and from an IT point of view, they're independent entities. Um, so with that, from in terms of getting data from one to the next, they have to go through some of the same. They have some of the same challenges as independent entities do in terms of getting the data from point A to point B and cross-indexing it uh, so that or, or reconciling it so that it fits with that system. And often what you're doing is you're making copies of that data as you take it from PAX A to point PAX B. Uh, and then you have to have different archiving policy or retention policies. Um, in an integrated health system, the reason you'll see here I've, I've marked it as, as you know, yellow for both private HA and cloud is that in these type of organizations where they've kind of achieved that level of they've got a one big EMR, all of the data from all of the different facility PAC systems have been migrated into a common BNA or they've consolidated a one big shared PACs. They've got all the MRNs cross-indexed and as they buy a new hospital, they upload all those MRNs, cross-index it and absorb all that data. What often happens is that there's a strong, and at that type of scale and IT capability, there's a strong uh, push to basically use all the clinical services within the network and keep everything in. So they really discourage the need to externally, but they can't eliminate it. Um, but so in this case, I've marked this as, you know, you would use cloud-based image sharing for ad hoc where you have to leave that kind of internal network, but the internal network is very strong. Um, last two variants. Um, if you have an integrated health network in a public health jurisdiction where you have kind of a single payer, you see this commonly in, in public health jurisdictions like Canada and some other countries, uh, it makes a lot of sense where you already have clinical clinical information or services alignment or, or you know information integration across a set of hospitals. Otherwise, you have a, a health integration network that's been dictated or defined. It often is easily much easier to justify the investment in this private HIE and basically let's all agree U10 hospitals, U20 hospitals are going to share a common infrastructure for VNA or PACs, and it will define a strategy for cross-indexing the legacy MRNs. Um, so in this case, it can be the private HIE can be a, quite a strong uh, option, but even in these cases where they you have two of these groups bordering, so somebody who's say on a state line as a facility. If they have to, some of their patients are going into that state, some of their patients are into the other state, they are stuck in the middle having to access both. So sometimes sharing data across those two, if there isn't a formal infrastructure that shares data between the two HIEs, uh, cloud-based image sharing can be very useful uh, and low-cost basic sharing between those two. And then, and then for completeness, I can also cover uh, closed health networks. So these are cases where you may have a security reason that is going to prevent somebody from uh, basically sharing outside of that network and they force use of the private HIE. Uh, so and this is generally driven by security regulations or some sensitivity of the <coughs> patient's content. So those kind of, <coughs> excuse me, that kind of covers the, you know, the methods and some of the scenarios and, and, and the strengths and weaknesses of those. So what can you do as a, as a provider to prepare your systems and uh, data and people to start to share data. So one of the things you'll see is everybody complains <coughs> excuse me, when images are being shared with them if those images are incomplete, in other words, they don't have all the identifiers or all the, all the metadata that you want or they're inconsistent, they have all kinds of different anatomy tags, um, so it's, it becomes a real challenge. So what's ironic is that a lot of people, the same people who are complaining about the inbound often don't have you know, the programs to make sure that the data they're sharing out is of high quality. So let's start, you know, with our reflecting on ourselves and say, what can we do to make sure that the content that we are managing, when sent and absorbed or received by other people, shared with other people, that it's as good a quality as we can make it. So first, 
you can define an imaging record quality policy. What I mean by that is, what do you as an organization deem as a complete and consistent imaging record? Specifically, which DICOM attributes should always have an, a value? What should those values conform to? Uh, making sure that they are current and up to date based on what your EMR. Also, what EMR record quality policy you have you should also reflect on that and use it as import. Get the CMIO to endorse it, and then publish that policy within your within your enterprise. Then the next phase would be to go and detect and report on that quality policy compliance to determine from all the millions of records you potentially are managing, how many of those things are are complying with that policy. Looking at your working with your PACs and BNA partner vendors, say what tools are there or what tools can you go and look at. Uh, that might be open source or external, that allow you to analyze that and to look at ways to correct it. And then you want to also look at where are the sources of these non-compliance. So is it a specific clinical group or clinic specific system that is providing data into your VNA or PACs, or is it a specific modality that is that is non that is producing non-compliant data? And then going out and developing tools to correct the data that you are storing, find ways to uh, correct it as it's coming in, so perhaps mapping one attribute value to another, or segregating that data. So if, if a, if a non-conformant data is detected, segregated into a, a virtual pool, a sandbox to be corrected, or in, or in really heinous cases, reject the, do not allow the storage of that because the, it is so low quality or so non-conformant it could be dangerous to allow access to it. Um, and then go and try and apply those corrections at the earliest pace, and you'll often find that you'll require training or workflow changes um, to to get ahead of that thing, and this I call this a program because this is not a, a simple flip of the switch. It's a, a commitment to, to making that improvement. So before image sharing, what are the other things that you can you can uh, set there? You have your uh, system preparation. You can look at your systems interfaces, your data integration specifications, your network assessments. You can also you also need to assess the capabilities of your people. Do they understand the information to know how to troubleshoot? When studies come in with non-consistent records, do you have enough people to manage all of these uh, inbound volume based on the volume? Because as the easier make it is to share, the, the volume uh, logically would increase. Do you have policies and procedures? So, do you have uh, policies uh, not only around the record quality, but who should be allowed to initiate a share of that data? Is it anybody who has access to the PACs? Is it anybody who uh, you know, uh, has access to an enterprise viewer, and then also when you're receiving that content in from external sources, what are your retention policies? Do you have a different policy for images you generated within your enterprise versus those shared with you? And you need to make sure that your tools and your and your training of people support those. Um, and also the the image sharing process and procedure development. So you know you're going to have new people come in all all the time. Do you do you have training and process and procedures of who to call if they're having a difficult up with a CD in front of you, or somebody says they want to share something with you, or people know how to get support for that kind of thing. And even if you have the imaging quality policy and all the procedures and everything all set, um, you're always going to have or typically you will have images that even when they're reconciled, they're cross-indexed, and you're following all the best practices, there are some parts of that imaging record which do not get reconciled. Uh, and that is, for example, things like the series descriptions uh, and some of the, the lower level uh, in terms of the information hierarchy of that study. And how that can affect you is uh, also with protocols. So if your organization has a very standard protocol of doing, for example, head CTs, but you're importing images from another organization, they may have a very different acquisition protocol. But if your users can't, don't that exam, they may think that perhaps their techs are not following protocol, but in fact, they didn't acquire the study. So there's a lot of things you have to just somehow educate your users that the system can change or behave differently when you're taking in the imported studies. And some of those things, um, you know, you just can't override or update those values uh, easily or, or, or safely. So you want to avoid the confusion and frustration. So in terms of getting those images once you've acquired them and you've got your hands on them and you want to reconcile those things, you'll get 
a bunch of images and whatever media or method they're coming in, there's certain attributes in the DICOM headers. These are database fields that are contained in those images. And they'll have specific values that were valid for the sending organization but are perhaps invalid for your internal organization. So what I mean by reconciliation is generally the process of taking some images from outside, getting a message of some form, generally it's a, an order uh, that's been generated uh, from your internal system that contains the patient ID uh, from the patient identity information from your local EMR, the, an accession number that's registered in that EMR, and then there's a process or a, a, a piece of software that basically reconciles it so that new study coming in uh, now links up with any other studies that that patient has, links up with that patient and, and, and is now known to the, to the EMR and this, this reconcile. And that can be done uh, a number of different ways. It can be done with, in the sandbox, as I described. It can be done while the data, perhaps while it's in the cloud still. Uh, it also could be done on your receiving system, your PACS, your VNA, if they have a, a tool set for that. So once you've got that information into the PACS or the VNA, you often need to let the EMR know that the study is there and available for them. So this is a, a notification that goes up the um, EMR to say these records are available. And the primary purpose of that is so that that system can generate a link, typically a URL, so they can launch an enterprise viewer so it can actually view those images within the EMR. Um, there are some newer methods or models that are emerging, such as an on-demand query capability. So that the EMR could actually, on demand of loading that patient view, ask your PACs, your VNA, what are all the studies we have patient messaging. But those are newer, and it really depends on what your EMR is capable of and also your, um, your, your image management system. One of the benefits of making access to the EMR data or to the, the shared images within the EMR is that uh, you can apply all of the EMR access control policies. So rather than letting the, the content uh, people browse and search around, they go in and look at the patient. So if you have an access control policy that prevents me from accessing this patient's data, they therefore can't get to the launching link that allows them to see those images. So the benefit of this is that the more users you can move on to the enterprise viewer in the EMR, the better you can have them have, uh, have that access of the imaging records comply with what's already configured in your EMR. And you don't have to have a separate rule system and logic and roles and, and, and mappings. So this can be uh, quite useful for compliance with uh, data access policies. So the other couple things I'll mention uh, before I hand it off to, uh, to Jim is, when you're sharing these images, increasingly we have more and more content, which is what we call enterprise images. So these are not just your traditional DICOM images that are stored in your packs. And as we share data from through HIEs or other things, you may have a very important piece of content that is not in DICOM that you want to go with that imaging study. So in private HIE, you know, as I mentioned, the XDSI, but also the XDS to transfer that. In cloud-based systems, you may have an ability to upload an attachment or a link or something like a PDF or something you can send with it that the consumer can then view or download and incorporate. Um, portable media, it's much more difficult. If you get a CD that's got all kinds of different types of format of stuff, it's rather difficult to find a, a way to get that and place it within uh, and preserve it within one of your imaging systems. Uh, the last thing I'll mention here is the, you know, when we talk about sharing is People often really focus on moving the images from point A to point B, but as we emerge and we start to get you know, more capabilities and technical advancements, I often ask people, do you actually have to have those images? Do you need to move those 5,000 slice CTs from point A to P, point B, or just see those images? So in, in these cases, you can look at, for example, cloud imaging. I may send up you know, 30 different studies for the patient. I basically wrote every study I have up. And then you as a consumer can look at it while it's in that image sharing cloud and say, well, these are the two that are relevant for the, for the clinical case or the, the diagnostic review that I'm going to do. And so those are the ones I'm going to look at here and then choose to, I'm only going to download those. And that can save a lot of time and save a lot of money. So when you're looking at image sharing, obviously portable media uh, doesn't provide this, but you may find this capable capability in the private HAE, um, but often you will find it in the cloud-based image viewing, and that can save a lot of uh, cost. 
So in closing, uh, and the, the paper goes into a lot more detail than what we're able to cover here today, but I always uh, encourage you to really understand your scenario and the methods that fit you. Chances are you're not going to be able to find one single method that addresses every affiliate or, or sharing use case that you have. Take a look at your data. If you're going to share it, if you want good quality in, be a good <laughs> a community partner and make sure your data is of the highest quality as you can. Make sure your systems are ready for that, your people understand it, your policies are there. Understand from an imaging informatics point of view, uh, and again I encourage looking at IT, what are some of the best ways to do information reconciliation so inbound records get treated the same as if they were acquired or managed at your facility. Policies and procedures, make sure you have them, make sure that they're based on what your business goals are, your clinical uh, service lines are. And then not only think about getting those images in the packs, but think about in today's environment, you always have to think this content coming in is part of a medical record. It doesn't just have to fit in your packs. It also has to make sense all the way up to being identifiable and referenceable in the, in the EMR. So thank you for your time. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to hand this over to, to Jim. And, all right. Uh, go ahead, Jim. Very good. All right, excellent. Thank you, Don. So as Don and Lori said, I'm the Director of Imaging Informatics at the University of Rochester Med Medical Center in Western New York, where we have relied on a cloud-based image exchange using Life Image for the last two and a half years. And my goal here this afternoon is to share some experience with you that we've had with, with cloud-based image exchange. So. Uh, at the Western New York Trauma Center and Regional Tertiary Care Medical Center, we have a hub-and-spoke referral model with dozens of hospitals and healthcare delivery organizations routinely sending us imaging studies from as far east as uh, Albany. Uh, you can see this back all the way over to Albany on the east and then to the west to Buffalo and all the way down to the Pennsylvania state line. So by 2012, our image library had become a CD factory, taking in literally tens of thousands of CDs per year. And this was a very inefficient it was a process, and it was very frustrating for our health care providers. So why, why is the CD factory a problem? Well, portable media, there, there, there are a number of issues and problems that go with portable media. And the first is uh, CDs are inherently insecure. So they're unencrypted typically. There's no chain of custody. And you know they're easily lost. There's inconsistent um, image reliability. So in, in some cases, the imaging study themselves are just simply not uh, to use on the media itself. And then more commonly, inconsistent viewer reliability. So uh, in one circumstance at one facility with a certain set of uh, with operating system and certain security patches may not work at all here at the tertiary care facility. And also it's, it's a very uh, inefficient workflow. Um, so you know the, the manual touching of that physical media is, is very inefficient both on the sending and receiving side and typically there, there's a there's a time lag it's you know, there's up to 24 hours even with overnight shipping. So, and and as my colleagues have pointed out, the uh, CDs are uh, hard to destroy. So again, from a security perspective. So for these reasons, uh, by by 2012, it was clear to us that the CD factory had to go. We needed to go into another direction, and the focus was, of course, patient care. So it's all about patient care, and. Quite frankly, sometimes healthcare IT professionals get too caught up in the technology itself and lose focus on, on healthcare outcomes. Confident that a cloud-based image exchange technology would improve patient care, and that certainly has uh, proven to be the case in three big ways for us. The first is that the imaging studies arrive typically before the patient. So with cloud-based image exchange, if you imagine in our trauma center, for example, um, the images arrive and are viewed by the trauma surgeons as the patient is in the helicopter or ambulance on their way in. Um, also, same, same is true you know, for stroke and other areas, but more importantly, as you move on think about transporting the patient, a cloud-based image exchange is real-time, so it enables real-time decisions on patient transport. 
our goal here is to keep sick patients out in the regional hospitals and bring only the sickest patients into the tertiary care medical center or trauma center as the case may be. And another example that around on the outbound, uh, in the case of our organ donor recovery program, we can enable, we can send images in real time through the cloud and enable physicians at Pittsburgh, Cleveland, New York City, etc., to make decisions about whether or not to transport organs to that facility for, for transplant. So again, it, it enables real-time decision making. And then of course it un eliminates unnecessary duplicative imaging, which uh, eliminates unnecessary dose, it eliminates unnecessary expense, and again it speeds up the, the patient care experience. And so how does how does cloud-based image exchange do that for us? Well, it provides a number of efficiencies. And the first is in that workflow. So it's significantly an effort required for us to import patients into, uh, sorry, imaging studies into PACS or to make the imaging studies simply available to our providers. On the sending side, in most cases, the, we enable the, the facilities that send images to us routinely directly from their PACS. Not only do they not have to burn any CD or print any films and go through the hassle of shipping, it's literally as simple as sending out of their packs through the cloud exchange. On our side, on the receiving side, it eliminates a significant overhead that's associated with, over, with handling of tens of thousands of CDs on an annual basis. And so to show some data, and I don't have the, the last quarter data, but the, this gap is actually even more dramatic. And what you can see here, is that in late 2014, uh, just a little over a year of full implementation, our cloud-based image study far exceeds our CD-based ingestion at this time. And that results from the workflow efficiencies, both on the sending and the receiving side. And again, uh, we did show data at RSNA that shows that uh, this is an even more dramatic with favoring the cloud-based ingestion. So another way that we get efficiency is uh, through what we would call a gatekeeper functionality. And so the images come in, and they come into a viewer, and a provider actually has to look at them and nominate them for promotion into PACS. We don't, we don't want to take just every single imaging study. Going back to Don's uh, concept about quality, we only, want to we only want to integrate studies into our PACS, archive those studies that are valuable for the care of the patient. They're high quality and they're relevant to the treatment of our patients. And so we can show, we, we keep track of, again, here you can see the top line, these are trend lines. But the top line shows that right now we're on track. We, we receive about 100,000 foreign imaging studies per year. But only about 70% of those, this is the lower trend line down here in the lighter bars, only about 70% of those actually go into PACS. And that's because of this gatekeeper uh, functionality and the efficiency it provides. Now, the, the other thing that this does for us, let me just move on to the next image here, is it simplifies the IT requirements. So Don had previously mentioned a direct WAN to LAN uh, connection. And what that image without this cloud it conveys is you know, a direct exchange from one organization to the next. But what it doesn't capture is the complexity and the overhead associated with a business-to-business -business VPN that has to be maintained between these organizations. And you can scale, that's one. Well, what if you're routinely receiving imaging studies from literally dozens of healthcare delivery organizations in the area? You now have to build out dozens of business-to-business -business VPN tunnels. And many of your smaller practices either don't have the IT staffing, the experience and expertise, or both to maintain the, the business-to-business VPN tunnels. Cloud-based image exchange simply does away with that business-to-business -business VPN overhead, and it also allows ad hoc sharing of images. You don't have to uh, establish this relationship, this direct LAN-WAN connection with all the organizations in the area ahead of time. And finally, in our case, the fourth area where we've received uh, significant efficiency goes back to this ability to ensure consistent normalization of the data that's coming in. So going back to the diagram that Don showed, what it really does for us is it ensures that we have studies that are brought in 
that, uh, that are generated externally have the same exam code definitions, the same modality defini definitions, et cetera. So the metadata is, matches our metadata. That and contextual both in the EMR and in the PACS viewer. They hang properly in hanging protocols, et cetera. For the referring provider, when they see an imaging study in the EMR, they understand what it is and what, what body part it relates to. It's consistent with the imaging studies we generate here at U of R Medicine. So those are the significant efficiencies. So if we, we've improved patient care and we've realized a number of efficiencies in, in implementing the cloud-based image exchange process. So the next step for us was to leverage uh, the, the platform to the enterprise. It's a significant investment, including the software as well as building out the processes and the support. So it's very important to leverage the cloud-based image exchange platform throughout the enterprise. So we've had some unique uh, use cases that I would share with you, one of which would be our organ uh, donor organ recovery network, which again has a need to, ex to exchange images out to Pittsburgh, New York City, Cleveland, et cetera, echoes of the heart, CT of the lungs, et cetera, that allow uh, real-time decisions about whether to fly those organs to a potential donor at one of those cities. Another good example is in western New York, most pediatric heart uh, surgeries are actually done here at the Golisano Children's Hospital in Rochester. And the providers throughout Western New York from Syracuse, Buffalo, Rochester work together cooperatively. And one of the ways that they do that is through cloud-based image exchange. And that facilitates uh, patient care and planning and, and uh, post-follow-up information or follow-up treatment as well. So with that, I'm going to give it back to Lori, who's going to entertain uh, question and answer. Thank you. Um, today's webinar comes to you from LifeImage. LifeImage is a network for connecting users and systems to patients' imaging histories online. For more information about that, please visit www.lifeimage.com. Now we'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. As a reminder, please use the questions section on the GoToWebinar panel to submit your questions to Don and Jim. First question. What were some of the more successful change management methods you used to get your affiliates from using portable media and to start using the cloud service? Okay. All right. So um, here at University of Rochester, we're, we're fortunate we have a uh, regional IT group. So there's a regional IT team. Uh, there's a director of that team, which is uh, my peer. And we engage them. So it's very important to have a committed and dedicated implementation. This group went out and worked with each of the regional facilities, and I think in the initial six-month uh, deployment, they, they enabled over 19 facilities uh, to send to us. And that was that committed, um, that committed IT resource from the receiving site was, was key. Another key function that we found was to set up a transfer center workflow. Um, so setting up through the transfer center um, a process to streamline to ensure that the images do indeed arrive before the patient for a stroke, for, for trauma, et cetera. So I think those are two of the, the change control, the, you know, the change management methods to think about going into a cloud image exchange. Make sure you have your workflows designed and ready to go before you start to implement. In, in, in our case, we used our transfer center for that. And committed resources, uh, committed resources to enabling your partner facilities that are sending you images to succeed with uh, cloud image exchange, as well as dealing with the security and privacy considerations and, and uh, things of that nature. Stephen would like to know if you can speak more specifically about how you're accomplishing the data normalization for these imported studies after they're nominated to PACS. Is this being done manually by your image records group, or have you managed to automate it? All right. So. Um, the, in our case, again, we're using Life Image as the cloud-based image exchange platform, and um, what what it allows us to do for that normalization is we schedule into our RISC, and Life Image has a DICOM modality work list function, which is really very very nice because it um, it DICOM wrap DICOM transform really it, it updates your DICOM tags uh, to match those of the modality work list. 
So um, if you know your MRN matches the demographics that come from your reg system, all match whatever exam code is, is assigned at the time of scheduling the order and the risk, all matches. So your modality, uh, your DICOM tags come in as if they were um, as if they were you know assigned here, as if the imaging study was generated here at U of R Medicine. Uh, the other thing that's very nice about in, in this case is a, a unique SUID is also generated. So you don't run into duplicate SUID issues if the case comes up. But uh, it's accomplished through scheduling into your risks and then uh, DICOM modality work list. This one looks like it's for Jim. Did UR Medicine go through a formal RFP process when choosing an imaging platform? Yes, we did. All right, this looks like it's for Don. Um, any advice on getting an HIE to adopt XDSI so that I can leverage image sharing within that platform? Yeah, and, and the paper talks a bit more about, you know, what are the common priorities for HIEs, which is typically starting with clinical data like results and medical summaries. Um, really, if you have if you have an HIE that is kind of finding its way to provide a, um, and I talk a bit about this in the paper, uh, you know, a, a simple business model and a governance model and has on-ramped a number of constituents uh, for that consortium participants, then it's a matter of, first of all, the, the source organizations either have to supply certain XDSI interfaces or they have to use some form of broker to, to broker between typical DICOM and the XTSI. Um, the main thing is, is the HIE, going to the HIE group and explaining to them why the image sharing uh, is, is a, a value and getting the agreement on what actors that their systems will play. So the most obvious ones is if they play the role of the PICS manager, that means all of the participants will send their ADT information in and that will act as the um, kind of the EMPI across the facilities in the in the consortium, and also the XDS document registry, which is essentially the index of everything that each of the participants is sharing. Now, I will comment that in some cases, the participants will, depending on the nature of the consortium, will publish a, a reference called a manifest. We'll publish that manifest, the reference to it. Um, for everything they acquire. In other cases, it will be selective. So, for example, they may, they may only choose on a transactional basis which patient's records they are going to make available to be indexed and therefore discoverable and retrievable. Uh, but it's a matter of going to them and, and getting them to agree on which actors they're going to play and then they've got to source those systems and, and do the rollout. Bob would like to know, in a shared cloud solution, how is cost allocated to all the participants? Do you want to take that down, or do you want me to take a stab at it? Uh, well, since you're operating one, I think you're probably more appropriate to comment on it. Sure. So, uh, honestly, we, we've done, a, and Don and I were actually just talking about this a little before the, the webinar, uh, we've done a very good job here at Rochester at assigning those costs per study down to um, individual imaging types. Um, and But in the case of, of uh, image exchange, Right now, we've centralized that. What is interesting is we, we do know down to the penny what those costs are. And then also through the nomination process, because again, there's the gatekeeper function that allows you to choose which uh, imaging studies come into, into PACS. They're nominated by users. And so you can actually then assign those users to a department and um, do a profit loss or actual direct assignment of cost that way. So you, you can actually say, OK, of 70,000 studies that came in, uh, 15,000 were neuro, you know, 20,000 were trauma, et cetera. So it's, it's, through, it's through the nomination process. And just like any other imaging study, you can actually, through the software and, and storage and the uh, support cost, track the cost per study down to the penny. This looks like it's for Don. IHE XDS seems to be more popular in Europe and Canada than in the U.S. as a method to exchange health information. Why is that? Um, yeah, there are some jurisdictions around the world where 
Uh, and it typically the, the early adoptions there were publicly funded or um, you know kind of national health systems, and they they were essentially operating the health system, and the lack of image sharing was a great burden on them because their constituents, their their, their citizens did not benefit from the sharing of those images or a longitudinal patient record. So they looked to what international standards or frameworks like IG existed um, to do that. And they also wanted to have an open, competitive, uh, you know, vendor ecosystem that they could, they could ensure that people could buy, you know, from different suppliers, but yet fit in this common uh, integration and, and information sharing network. So in those cases, if, if the government is operating the registry or an agency of the government that is backed by the financial stability of the government or, that, or the, the health ministry, whatever it is, then the participants can have a lot of confidence that if they, if they start to use it, that it will continue to exist today and tomorrow and in future. In other words, they, they, they have some reliability that's going to be there and not um, fail and then you know the operations stop and they got to start all over again. Uh, secondarily in some of these cases whether it be public health or, or like a military system uh, you have an alignment of governance. You can you have a basically an organi part of an organization that says this is how we're doing it. Your funding of IT systems depends on your compliance with these approaches because we expect to gain the benefits promised by this approach. In the U.S., where it's much more competitive, and you have health systems that are actually competing with each other, who is trusted to operate that index of where all the data is? If it's one health system, perhaps the other health system doesn't trust that that health system is going to use it only for the image sharing process, not data mining to market clinical services to it. Is it if it's an independent health information exchange operator? What is the financial viability of that? It's going to be very, you know, a lot of effort and cost to hook all these pieces up and start to publish all this data and if they disappear then you know we're back to square one so it's just I think it's the nature of the of the, of the payment system and, and, and more explicitly the governance around that that has driven it made a more natural fit in some jurisdictions than the US but the technology is I mean agnostic to the those environments it has to do with more who, who is actually running it and who's actually paying for it all right, thank you. That was our last question. So that will conclude the webinar. Um, thank you for joining us today, and thank you, Don and Jim, for an interesting and informative presentation. As a reminder to attendees, watch your email for a follow-up that has links to the recording of today's webinar, the white paper, and a PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. We look forward to seeing you at our next HIS Talk webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.